Welcome to Make Life Fun. I'm your host, Josie Wheatman, founder of Backroads Coaching, where we pave our own path to self-acceptance. Think of me as your self-love bestie, here to guide you, support you as you let go, rewrite the thoughts and beliefs that are blocking you from loving yourself and living your best life. This season, we are talking business, pleasure, love, money, and of course, all things motherhood. This is a sponsored episode by Regila Beauty. As women, our skincare needs are constantly evolving and changing, so it can get a little confusing when we need a new item to fit into our existing skincare routine to tackle new issues. Regila Beauty has a wide variety of items that are built to fit into your routine, whether you have youthful skin, mature skin, you're expecting, or you're even a new mama. If I told you that you could enjoy these benefits without the inconvenience or expense of changing your current skincare routine, but just by adding something wonderful and affordable to it. Skin that looks and feels more even-toned, firmer, hydrated, radiant, smoother, smaller pores. Well, Regila Beauty has the Hydrating Serum, and it is that something wonderful that I'm speaking of. It is perfect for busy moms at any stage of motherhood, whether you're trying to conceive, currently pregnant, nursing, or preparing for an empty nest. Our serum is the clean beauty, fuss-free add-in you've been looking for. It's formulated to be non-irritating for even the most sensitive skin. It's full of beautifying botanicals featuring hyaluronic acid, niacinamide, and vitamin C, the ultimate anti-aging trifecta. It sinks right into your skin effortlessly between your current toner, moisturizer, without feeling greasy or sticky. It's unscented and also free of toxic ingredients that could harm your health. Get it today by visiting Regila's Amazon shop at amazon.com slash Regila, R-E-J-A-L-L-A, or click the link in the description box now. Welcome back to Make Life Fun. Today we are deep diving into my personal journey and deep dive into my personal bloom journey of 2022. So I am going a little deeper and I'm sharing some personal things with you guys in hopes that it will inspire and move you and most of all, get you to take action. So I hope that you enjoy this conversation and have a wonderful day. Yeah. Hi, welcome back to the Make Life Fun Show. Today, we're going to have a solo episode where we're just going to talk about the year. Can we believe it? 2023. Mind blowing. Like this year for me has been all about slowing down to speed up. When I look back in my diary and my journal, that was the message that came through loud and clear for the year was slowing down. And as most of you know, my word this year was bloom. And so That was a big, that's been a big, big catalyst for me moving through. And I, as I was going through bloom, oh, I just remember waking up, it was during the spring and there was one, oh, what is it? A tulip. It was one tulip. It was an orange, orange and yellow tulip that grew outside my window. And that tulip taught me how to bloom. And when I went through the bloom journey, my heart kept telling me that, The acronym for bloom has to be, we have to believe in ourselves and we have to love ourselves and we have to be open to receive more and also observe what is going on within us to be able to magnetize to us what we want. And so that is what the year has been looking for me is how can I find ways to believe in myself deeper? How can I find ways to love myself more and not just myself, my family members, my friends and my community. And how can I be open? How can I open my heart to observe without judgment, to observe without, without the pain and suffering? Am I able to do that? And how can I magnetize to me the things that I truly desire? And so what I've learned is we got to slow down. We got to, we really want something and we go for it. And that's all we focus on. And we go We go full pedal to the metal and that's all we see. We see nothing else, but slowing down and taking, taking a step back to really fully be present with each thing that you're moving through and really relaxing into it gave me a place of where I was coming from a more open heart. I was speaking from more of a higher place. I was more led and guided. And so this year has just been actually, I mean, I've moved through some hard, challenging things, but I found it 
a little bit easier because of my word for the year, which was bloom. Yeah, so letting go of judgment, that is hard. But first, the first thing we have to do is let go of judgment for ourselves. Because the, what we want to do is anything bad that we're feeling or anything bad that comes up for us, we instantly want to judge it. And we instantly want to label it as bad. But really, it's not bad. Our emotions are here to teach us something. So when we feel sadness, when we feel that deep sense of sadness, how can we look at ourselves with a little bit of compassion and be like, why is that the right emotion that I should be feeling right now? Like, why is this like, or if we're angry at our spouse because they said something that triggered us, like, okay, I'm triggered. Why is it that this is the perfect emotion for me to feel right now? Because our body is our teacher, our emotions are teacher. And so when we feel these triggers and when we feel these pains and we instantly want to judge, if we were to take a compassionate look, like we are, our body is doing exactly what it needs to do. And so if we can be sort of less judgmental and more observing, like it takes a lot of awareness. So that's the first start. Like you have to be aware that your body is triggered. You have to be aware that you are sad. Once you sit in that, then the judgment kind of sort of leaves because you're in awareness for other people. Same thing. When we want to look at our spouse, like they said something that triggered us and, oh, they meant to harm us and they're a hurtful person is how can we start to look at them? Like we chose this person, their intentions are good. Like how can we rewire ourselves to see the good in them and not see the bad in them? And that's the way I've been working. And it's a practice. It's working. It's not something that comes natural. You have to work to see it that way, to be less judgmental. And when you are judgmental, give yourself grace because we're human. We make mistakes. We're judgmental. Giving yourself that grace to be like, okay, this is what I did this time. This is not what I want to do next time. Like my mantra is I want to be more loving. I want to be more loving in my heart. I want to be more loving with the people around me. And so I'm not going to hit the nail on the head every time, but how can I be more loving the next time? We are going to get triggered, especially with the holidays coming with our family members and they know us better than anyone. It's not an intentional, I'm going to poke you where it hurts the most, but they know you the best out of everyone. And so when they speak, sometimes it truly cuts to the core and it really, really hurts. And we just are triggered and we're triggered because of so many things. Like we've been through a whole life and the life that we've lived hasn't always been easy. And the triggers that exist in, in our bodies is because of emotions that we never process, emotions that we never release. And so each time you're triggered, that's an invitation to be like, yes, I know this sounds so awful because we don't want to think that way. We want to think, how can we push this away? How can we shove it back down? But the, we need to let it come up. We need to let the trigger arise. That's an invitation to heal. That's an invitation to release. That's an invitation to feel the feeling because your body now believes that you can handle it. That's why it's coming up for you. It's like you've done the work to get to a place where you can sense it. You can sense the tightness. You can sense the contraction because there was a time where you were triggered, but you didn't feel the trigger. You just lashed out. And so the fact that you have the awareness that you're triggered is an invitation to release it. And so what my practice is relaxing. So when I feel the trigger, when I feel my heart get tight, when I feel like I want to cuss and say bad things, I allow myself to relax into it and allow myself to feel the trigger. Like I allow my body to move it through me. And I heard a spiritual teacher talk about like giving it to a higher power, giving the, just giving it up, like giving it away. And so that's, Another, it's a practice. It's all a practice, but the trigger is an invitation to heal, an invitation to release, and it's asking you to relax your body and allowing it to come up. Sometimes it's going to come up with sadness. Sometimes it's going to come up with anger. And instead of giving that to somebody else, just let it come up. Just feel it, feel it, feel it, feel it, feel it until it dissipates. And what that's going to do, it's going to allow you to address the problem because there's still a problem, but now you're going to be able to do it from that place of compassion that we're talking about. We're going to talk about it. Like when you said this, it made me feel this, but now you don't have the, the tightness, the anger, the fight. Now you have 
a place where you can come at it from a compassionate heart. It depends on the trigger. Sometimes when you let the trigger go, when you are able to relax into the emotion, when you're able to, like for some people, it's going to be meditative. For some people, it's going to be sitting down, meditating, like feeling your, some people it's going to be moving. They're going to want to go out for a run, like to let go of it. For some people, it's going to be screaming your head off. Like everyone releases differently. So you are going to have to find what works for you to release, for you to relax into the emotion, into the trigger so that you're not projecting. But once you've done through it, then you can, you're calm. You're coming from a higher place. The fact that you were able to do that, to release it, now you can realize in yourself, is this something that I want to address that is going to make me feel better and the other person feel better to work through it? Or is this something that I can truly just let go? How is it? Is this something that has been going on for years with my significant other and I need to address it or it's never going to change? Or is this just something that was my trigger from childhood that has nothing to do with what this person just said? Like what they said to this feeling that I'm feeling, it doesn't usually for me, what I'm finding, it doesn't go hand in hand because the trigger says that he's trying to harm me. He's hurting me. I'm not safe. But when I'm able to release and let go, I am safe. His intentions weren't to harm me, weren't to hurt me. Being triggered by the direct, the person who caused the trauma, I've definitely been there myself. It took a lot of work to be around that person. There was a time that I could not be around the person that caused the trauma that causes all most of my triggers now in adulthood. It took a long time and it took a lot of forgiveness. It took a lot of forgiveness work on myself, forgiving myself first and then forgiving them. Also realizing that they did the best they could with what they had. And, but it took a very long time for me to be around the person. And now my practice every time I'm around the person is that relaxing, that releasing, that looking at them from, with a compassionate heart, looking at them with love because they did the best they could. Like it doesn't release the fact that what they did was wrong, but there is a level of forgiveness there. There's a level of compassion there. And what I found is there was a moment that person couldn't be in the room with me. Like every time I would go home, that person was gone. Like they were not around. And I didn't even realize that until recently. And now that I've come to a place where I am able to hold all of it, feel all of it, that person is always in my space and is there. So there's something that happens deeper to our healing. Once we start healing these wounds, it doesn't affect just us. It affects the other person too. Yeah. By us doing the healing work now, we are healing our generation's so they say seven generations back and seven generations forward. So each time you release one of those triggers, each time you let your emotion bubble up to the surface to be released, you are doing powerful work. It's not easy. It's hard. It really is. But it is the best thing that you can do for yourself, for your family, for your children. Yeah, the first step for me for healing trauma was working with little Josie because she was the one who was traumatized. Little Josie was the one who felt trapped. She didn't feel heard. She didn't feel seen. She felt like she was thrown out like yesterday's trash. She didn't have a childhood. And so I had to go back and let her know, like I had to first let myself know that I don't live there anymore. Like I physically am a grown woman. I have like a part of me that is powerful. I have a part of me that can take charge, that knows what I need when I need it. And there's little Josie who's still sitting in trauma, who's feeling broken who's feeling not wanted, who wants to run away, who wants to hide. And so I had to let myself know that I don't live there anymore. Like I survived that. And then I had to go back and think little Josie, which even though I've done this work for so long, it still brings tears in my eyes that I had, like, we're not taught this. We have to go back and think that little part of us for being a survivor, for being so strong, for getting through that such a little vulnerable child, being able to find ways to cope. So having to go back and let her know that she is a rock star, she is amazing, she is a queen, like reminding her that we got out, reminding her that we have a beautiful life now, which is through writing and journaling, like journaling to dear little Josie. I call her little Jocelyn because that's my full name, Jocelyn. And I didn't become Josie until I believe the sixth grade. And so I call her little Jocelyn and I write her letters and I let her write letters back to me. 
And I went to a hypnotherapist and I worked with little Josie to like give her gifts and like, like truly like love her up, love her up. And by loving her up, I loved myself back to life. And once I did that, I thought the work was over. Don't we wish? <laughs> I'm like, oh, the work is over. But then I had to work with teenage Josie. She was the rebel. She didn't want to live. And I had to go back for her as well and let her know, like, I am so proud of you for letting it be known that you didn't want to live. Like, there was a part of you that wanted to fight. I had to let her know she wasn't a coward. That wasn't the cowardice way out. Like, I had to remind her that she was strong, that she, she was born to stand out. That was the message for my teenage self. She was born to influence the room. Like she was like, she was put in a room <laughs> with a bunch of people that didn't look like her. She was the only one that looked like herself, that spoke like herself, that dressed like herself. And her mission, like her whole purpose was to stand out. She did not know that. She wanted to fit in. She wanted to belong. She wanted to be like everybody else. And I had to remind her like she did the best she could too. And that healed another part of me. And so now I'm working with wealthy version of Josie because there is a wealthy version of myself that knows that she is worth it all and that she is, she's worth it all. There's nothing that she can't have if she really truly wants it. And so every time you think the work is done, it just gets deeper. You just ground deeper into yourself. And what happened to us, what happened to you wasn't your fault, but it is your responsibility to heal it. It is your responsibility to go back to those for those parts of yourself that were truly wounded and keep reminding them that they did the best they could and give them the message that they needed back then. Like for me, like you were born to stand out. You influence the room. Don't let the room influence you. That message was so powerful for me. Like if I would have heard that, like, wow. And so the fact that I could give that gift to her now is the best I can do. And it does something. It does something. Creating the same trauma that my parents did with me. I have not caught myself creating the same trauma that I was experiencing because my trauma was more physical and emotional abuse. Well, I guess when you think about the way we beat ourselves up and we tell ourselves that we're not enough, we're not worthy, we're never going to be enough, we're doing it wrong. That is a form of, that is a form of abuse to the self that we have to work on as well that mental chatter. But what I've learned is that voice in our head that tells us all that stuff is not who we are. It's not who we are. That is the voice that's been programmed. That's the voice that has witnessed all the things that's happened to us that wants to protect us. But truly we get to say, no, we get to dismiss the voice of I'm not enough. And we get to put something else in its place. And again, that's a different type of work. That's thought work. That's mindset work. And, but as far as like the trauma for me, it's reliving the same pattern. <laughs> like I didn't learn the lesson the first time. And so I'm going through these loops. Why does this keep happening? Why do I keep having the same conversation? Why does this same thing keep coming up? Well, once you're aware that the same thing is coming up, that is such a blessing because that's when you can start to go deeper into the same thing that's coming up and figure out what is it that I need to change? What is it do I need to do differently? What is asking for me to evolve here? And that's when we start to do the mindset work. That's when we start to do the inner child work. That's when we start to really like, when we find those, I know it's so awful to say, but when we find what is not working, that is like such a, such an aha, because we get to use that to create healing. We get to use that to create change. We get to use that to be a better version of ourselves. So for me, I used to think there was like an end, a light at the end of the tunnel, like the healing is over. Like we're going to do this work and it's done, but it's a, it's a life's mission. Like if you're on the healer's journey, you're in it forever. Like you never are healed. you never are fixed. You were never broken. <laughs> you're going through unfolding. You're going through learning who you truly are. You're learning to love yourself. So it's gonna, it's gonna take work and it's gonna take a long time there. And I wish somebody would have told me that there is no end. Like you don't become enlightened. And then it's all like, you get to live this happy life and get to where you're trying to go life. This is what we signed up for. We signed up for it to be full of contrast. We signed up for the hard where you're so heartbroken and life feels like it's never, the light's never going to come on, but then the light comes on and you're so filled with gratitude and you're so filled with love. We have to realize that this is what we signed up for. This is life. 
There's going to be hard. There's going to be triggers. There's going to be days where you don't want to get out of bed. This is life. This is what we sign up for. This is the journey. This is it. Yeah. The people that are intentional pokers, they are the wound stirrers. They, they have been traumatized the worst. The people that are hurting you, the people that are hurting others, they have been hurt. They have been hurt. They have been traumatized. They are holding pain, so much pain inside of themselves. And they are not, not feeling safe to look, to look at that wound. They don't want to go through the healing journey. They don't want to look. And so they're going to project all, I think about that, all that pain that is inside of them. They can't hold it. So they want to give it to somebody else. And that toxic poison, they just want to hand it over. And it's not even an intentional thing. It's just a relief thing. They want to feel better. And how can I feel better by making somebody feel like crap? Because misery loves company. And so we can't really help that person. And I thought for years I can help that person. I thought for years I could like make that person want to change and I could make them become aware of the pain that they're giving and the pain that they're feeling. But truly, we, until somebody is willing to look, willing to become aware, willing to even dip a toe in, there is absolutely nothing we can do for that person. All we can do is go on our own healing journey. All you can do is go on your own journey of healing so that you, sh- like they says in the Bible, shine your light so bright that others can't help but want to shine as well because they see it. So be the example of what it is like to heal what it is like to be free in your body that is all we can do we can't we can't help somebody who doesn't want help boundaries the only way to protect yourself from somebody toxic is boundaries strict boundaries even with my husband like he's the closest person to me so he will always be my example and he's okay with it so when he is down low in vibration I have to tell him, like, I can't even be around you at this moment. Like, I need to go find my peace. So what that means for me is sometimes going outside, going for a walk. What that means for me is turning on the music and having my own dance party and telling him to go in the room. Like, because vibrations don't mix. So like, when you're at a high vibration and somebody is down here, they are going to try everything in their power to get you to join them. And it's not even an intentional thing. They, it just is what they, we seek our own level. Like we want to be around people that are feeling like we are. So if somebody's too happy and you're miserable, that doesn't feel good. So you are going to push their button to try to get them down here, but it takes a level of awareness to be like, no, I'm not going to meet you where you are. Like I'm not going to. So for me, that boundary is I can't even be around you. I am such a sponge to energy and I feel it so very, very clearly. And it affects me in a way that I'm not even willing, even with my own partner, I'm not willing. Like you need to figure out a way to get yourself back up because I can't even help you do that. You have to do it for you because you're the only one that knows what's going to make you feel better. You're the only one that can do the work for yourself. Like I can give you tools all day long. I can give you 50 tools and you can pick your favorite, but I can't do the work for you. You have to do the work for yourself. So having a very strict boundary on your energy, like that's your life force. Like if you think of your energy as your life force, each time you give a piece of you away, that is chipping away at your life's force. And I don't think that anybody has that right to take that away from you. And so being protective and putting a boundary around it doesn't matter who the person is. It's a must. Like if you, I can't even be around a person who is sucking my soul. <laughs> like I need, I need to be away from that energy. I need to be around energies that are people that are uplifting me and loving me. That's why they say, I think Deepak Chopra is the one that says his number one advice, the spiritual teacher is to surround yourself with people that uplift you, to surround yourself with people that give you life. Like his number one advice is the people you surround yourself with. The only way we teach our children, I was just having this conversation with my brother. He is like, I'm going to make a man out of you. (laughs) I was like, there's no way you can make a man out of your child. The only way your child is going to learn what it is to be an outstanding, loving, compassionate human is you. That's it. We, our kids learn from us by like osmosis. I swear. They just are the sponge. Like you can say all day, whatever you want to say to them. They're not going to pick it up as much as watching and learning. And the book that your child is your teacher, 
I have to look at who's the author for that, but your child's your best teacher. It speaks about this. Like if we just go on living our lives the best we can, being the best version of ourselves when we can, I mean, it takes work. We are human, we make mistakes, but as we can live in that awareness, that is all we have to do. And it will just trickle down to our child. Because when we're being compassionate with ourselves, we're being compassionate with our children. When we're having boundaries for ourselves, we're showing that for our kid. And so the more you can love up on you, which is why self-love and self-acceptance is so powerful and so important, because that is the ticket to raising powerful, aware kids, is they see it and you're modeling it day in and day out, and they can't help but be that way. I was just talking about how Everett is so empathic and he's so he's such a, a child that knows energy. Like when my energy drops, his energy instantly drops. When my energy is high, his energy is instantly high. And so if I have that much power to affect his energy, I have this much power to affect everything. Going back to the motherhood, I can't believe Everett is what, 20 months now. And I remember even going on the motherhood journey, I used to think I didn't want to be a mom. I used to think I was just going to be this nomad <laughs> and live this nomadic lifestyle. And doing my healing made me realize that I definitely want a child. I just didn't want a, the child to be the broken version of me. Like the broken version of me didn't think she was worthy of having a child. But once I started doing the healing work, I realized that I can birth the next generation and I have the power to make it so he doesn't have the same traumas that I have. He's going to have his own because we're human and we live in this world, but I'm not going to be the one who impacts him in that way. And that was my mission. That was, that was my intention when I had my son. And so he was the catalyst for my rebirth. He was the catalyst for realizing that I am worthy of healing that I'm worthy of going deeper and doing this healing work, not only for myself, but for him as well. And so motherhood has taught me to be selfish, which I never imagined that would be the word I'd be using, but it's taught me to really look after myself. It's taught me to get help. I used to really just be alone in my feelings. I used to, when I was going through things, just swallow with my pain and just stay in it for days for, by myself. But now what I'm finding is I go and I get help. I say what I need to say. I, I look for ways to heal. And I'm always seeking of how can I heal my mental? How can I heal my physical body? And so when I'm going through hard times, I look for healers. I look for coaches. I look for therapists. I'm not alone in this. And there was a time that I felt so alone in my pain that I didn't want to live anymore. And I don't ever want to get to that place. And so motherhood has taught me, I have to be selfish. I have to put myself first because if I do not, who's going to take care of my son. And so if I can look after myself and make myself the number one priority, then effort is going to benefit. My husband's going to benefit. The world is going to benefit. My work is going to benefit. And so motherhood has taught me, yeah. I never thought that word would be the word, but selfish, 100%. Look at myself and heal myself and love myself and be compassionate with myself. Thank you for being part of the self-love movement. Your support and care matters here. Please be sure to subscribe, review, and share. And get your ultimate daily planner freebie today by visiting makelifefunpodcast.com. When you're ready to step deeper into my vibration and work together, go to backrosecoaching.com. Thank you again for listening. See you next time.